Uh, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, it is, of course, a huge honour and a privilege to have been invited to deliver the Wilbur and Orville Wright Memorial Lecture, and a remarkable achievement that uh, this is the 86th continuous lecture in that, uh, in that series. And we do, of course, honour here this evening the achievement of those two men who uh, 94 years ago at Kitty Hawk changed the course of history, uh, the future of the world, and uh, the lives of certainly all of us here present. Now I think the importance of this prestigious lecture and uh, the way in which it is perceived around the world couldn't be illustrated uh, possibly any better than that uh, this week, uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair, uh, Chancellor Kohl of Germany, uh, President uh, Chirac of France, Prime Minister Jospin of France, solely for the purpose of providing an appropriate lead-in to tonight's lecture, <laughs> rushed, rushed together, met, and uh, equally quickly uh, rushed out a statement as their contribution to uh, tonight's event, uh, where now for the aerospace industry. And uh, just in case anyone during the last uh, 48 hours has uh, been away on uh, Mars or, or anywhere else and hasn't actually read what that statement was, I would like to read just a few extracts from it uh, before I start. It says that uh, the governments of France, Germany, and the United Kingdom share a vital political and economic interest in the efficient and globally competitive European aerospace and defense electronics industry. This will help to improve Europe's position in the global market to promote European security and ensure that Europe will play a full role in its own defense in the future. We, the governments, are agreed on the urgent need to restructure the aerospace and defense electronics industries. This should embrace civil and military activities in the field of aerospace and should lead to European integration based on a balanced partnership. It goes on to say it is primarily for industry, not for government, to work out the structure required. We, the governments, undertake for our part to implement the necessary measures in national policies relating to this industry in order to facilitate such restructuring. And it then says, we ask that the industry should present a clear plan and detailed timetable for this restructuring and integration by the 31st of March 1998. I think uh, you'll all agree a uh, pretty unique and uh, historic statement. It's always difficult enough to get three European governments to agree on anything, but to agree on this absolutely vital direction uh, for the industry is quite remarkable and all solely for the purposes of their contribution to tonight's Wright Memorial Lecture. So what I would uh, like to do, I incidentally, uh, this time last week, there was in fact some doubt that uh, the wording uh, that I've just read out uh, would be trilaterally agreed in time for the announcement on Tuesday. And I was pondering uh, what effect this might have on my lecture. I felt that uh, on the credit side, it would uh, allow my lecture to be perceived afterwards with quite remarkable degree of clairvoyance. Uh, but on the negative side, uh, I would have to have been somewhat more guarded in my remarks than is now the case. So what I'd like to do, uh, with your permission tonight, is first of all to examine the factors that uh, have been at play and uh, which led to this uh, historic trilateral announcement this week. And uh, the unique challenge that uh, it represents to uh, the European industry, because it is uh, effectively the governments throwing down the gauntlet to uh, the industry. 
I will then um, address, address uh, briefly the hugely difficult issues that uh, now face the industry in meeting that challenge in the weeks and months uh, and indeed in the years ahead. And finally, I'd like to just touch upon the resultant, the possible resultant effect on that vital and all-important transatlantic uh, co collaborative and cooperative relationship uh, which is equally key to the future. Now, as the um, whole of this subject is laden, is absolutely dripping with controversy um, and really goes right to the heart of the, the whole European debate, I thought that uh, I might as well go the whole way and uh, begin the lecture with uh, another really uh, controversial few minutes and uh, really seek to link uh, that uh, day in Kitty Hawk 94 years ago, ago with the present day and therefore uh, what I'm going to talk about by presenting to you a, an entirely personal selection of the 16 airframe platforms that, in my view, have been most significant in that 94-year uh, period in uh, really charting the course for aerospace and the aerospace industry. Now, rather like the, uh, the lottery, uh, in launching into uh, this, I do fully realize that there is absolutely uh, zero chance or one in ten million chance uh, of any single person in this room agreeing with my choice of uh, 16 aircraft. And I thought that uh, having the, the total audience at disagreement with you is perhaps not a bad way of starting off the lecture and maybe I'll be able to uh, maintain that uh, throughout the, uh, the, the lecture. So let us start with uh, my choice of, uh, of maybe the great turning points in, uh, in the last century. Starting with the, uh, uh, the first 94 uh, years ago, the Wright Flyer itself and uh, our two uh, gold medal holders. My next significant uh, aircraft is driven by the First World War and uh, is the Sopwith Pup, Sopwith Camel, which together with the Fokker triplane really created the concept of dogfighting in aerial combat. For my next aircraft, well, I have to wait to the 1930s and uh, the Douglas DC-3, Dakota in the war, the world's first successful all-metal aircraft uh, monoplane which started many of today's airlines after the war. Then came the war and uh, the first successful monoplane fighter, the Hawker Hurricane, developed from the Fury which together with the great Rolls-Royce Merlin engine influenced the outcome more than any other of the Battle of Britain and therefore history. The de Havilland Mosquito pioneered the concept of low-level, high-speed, two-seat strike aircraft. And it was stealthy, uh, built from nature's composite plywood. <laughs> and then the, uh, the Messerschmitt 262, the world's first combat jet aircraft, which very fortunately Hitler completely uh, misunderstood, thought it was a bomber, when really it was an outstanding fighter. The Boeing B-17, not just for its contribution to daylight bombing, but because with over 8,000 built, it really was the foundation of the Boeing company of today, which has had such influence. After the war, the F-86 Sabre, one of the great fighters of all time, first supersonic jet fighter in a dive, the one that proved that dogfighting was as applicable to jet, the jet age as was, uh, it was to the First World War. The Boeing B-47 pioneered the concept of high aspect ratio, swept wings and potted engines on large aircraft, followed by all subsequent successful large aircraft. Of course, no list would be complete without the de Havilland Comet. I'm delighted John Cunningham's here to tonight, which pioneered jet travel, quiet, smooth, reliable, and led on to perhaps the most influential airliner uh, of all time, the airliner that shrunk the globe, the 707, developed, I should hasten to add, from the military KC-135 program. A lot of these are all military derivatives. 
On my list uh, next, the Harrier has to come as the aircraft which has demonstrated that VTOL is practical in military operations and combat and will lead on to JSF uh, and other vertical takeoff aircraft. The Boeing B747 massive breakthrough in ultra long range wide bodied transport. I've slept 42 nights on a 747 this year alone, <laughs> uh, a month and a half. Concorde has to be on the list, pioneered supersonic travel, proved that it is safe, reliable and regular and will lead to great things I know in the next century. On my list, A300 and A310 not only pioneered the concept of wide-bodied twins that proved that European collaboration can be commercially highly successful, and look what Airbus has done since. The F-16, the world's first real fly-by-wire aircraft to enter service, has sold around the world through the concept of offset, license production, and assembly. The B-2 only because it is a salutary lesson to all those that procure and build aircraft never again to concentrate on one form of technology regardless of cost. $40 billion for just 21 aircraft. I rather wonder how one could uh, go to war with uh, an, uh, an asset valued at some $2 billion if one could find a, a suitable reliable enemy to deploy it against. So uh, I hope I've uh, stirred you up enough with uh, disagreement to uh, keep you in that mood. And a number of you will now disregard completely what I have to say the rest of the evening while you uh, work out the, the real 16 uh, of your, your, your own choice. But we're now, uh, after all of that, in uh, the aerospace industry. What I'd like to do is during that century, which I have over five minutes or so, uh, skated very rapidly across, just trace what effect that's had uh, on the industry that have made those aircraft. I'd like to, if I may, stick to platforms uh, and therefore really airframes, uh, all the uh, SMEs and all the uh, system uh, suppliers and designers are equally important but uh, unless you have five hours to spare and we forget about dinner tonight, uh, I will uh, keep to the platforms and the platform integrators. So let us look at uh, the United Kingdom first. Here is really uh, what has been happening during that time. Uh, you see on the left the list of companies that had developed during the uh, pre-war phase, First World War and post-World War. And many of the, uh, the famous names, uh, the Vickers of Vimy fame, the, the super, Supermarine of uh, Schneider Trophy and Spitfire fame, Bristol right back to First World War, Bristol fighters, Bulldogs, uh, and, and into the Blenheims and Bow fighters. English Electric right back at the beginnings, the English Electric Wren, one of the very early aircraft in, uh, in history. Sopwith becoming Hawker uh, and moving on. The great... Uh, the Haviland Company, one of the, uh, the, the pioneers of the world in inventiveness uh, and conceptual development. Avros, Armstrong Whitworth, Handley Page, and, uh, and Weston. By 1970s, driven, of course, by uh, all those pressures that we have now become so familiar with, the uh, reduced procurement budgets, uh, particularly uh, on defense, and I will return to that, uh, the hugely increasing launch costs as uh, technology developed had resulted uh, in a reduction, a rationalization, a restructuring down to uh, just those six companies that you see there, uh, British Aircraft Corporation, BAC, uh, Hawker Sidley, <coughs> Scottish up at, uh, at Presswick, Shorts uh, by that time, of course, over in, in Belfast, Handley Page, and Westland. And then, of course, with the formation of British Aerospace in 1977, uh, the rationalization down to just, just two platform airframe uh, builders in this country. Um, Short Brothers, uh, purchased by Bombardier in Canada, and Hanley Page, uh, the great company of history, 
uh, could not actually lift its eyes away from the past and look into the future uh, and paid the, the, the ultimate penalty. So that's what happened in the United Kingdom. Uh, let's move uh, across onto uh, continental Europe and look at uh, what happened in, uh, in Germany and Holland. And as you can see, a very similar story. Uh, a lot of those great names, uh, Fokker from the Netherlands, uh, First World War, Second uh, World War, uh, and all that they did in uh, civil aircraft, uh, the Heinkels, the um, Junkers, Messerschmitt, Dornier, down now uh, to one DASA, uh, rationalization of 10 companies uh, down to one. Uh, looking uh, just across the channel, uh, uh, a similar story, and you're beginning to uh, see that the name of the game is uh, you need to have less boxes on the right of the picture than on the left. Uh, now down to uh, Aerospatiale and Dassault in France, and I suppose it would not take uh, the brains of a rocket scientist uh, to predict that uh, eventually uh, those will move together into one. And then looking uh, across the Atlantic, in the uh, United States, the huge, that the massive home market created a large number on the left of great uh, large companies and famous names. Douglas, uh, you saw an example of earlier on film, uh, McDonnell Douglas, Boeing I've mentioned and delighted that Ron Woodard is here tonight, um, Lockheed, Glenn Martin, Charles Vaught, Northrop Grumman, Hughes, and so on. Uh, and then, over the last 10 years, the, and, and you'll see many of those, in fact the majority of those companies are largely derived uh, and supported and sustained by uh, defense. In the last uh, 10 years, however, there has been no less than a 65% reduction in the United States uh, defense procurement uh, budgets. And this led in um, 1993 to the famous uh, William Perry Last Supper for the heads of uh, many of those companies. And this in turn triggered uh, the picture that you see with massive uh, and amazingly rapid rationalization of the US industry. So that's the picture that we're all very familiar with. And in fact, uh, massive rationalization and restructuring in, a, in an identical manner has clearly taken place in all four of the nations, uh, the, the great uh, aerospace producing nations in the world. So now let's look, but all nationally, now let's look at the resultant size of those companies uh, which I have listed. And as you know, and this is in uh, annual turnover in billions of dollars, as you know, and I think you can see uh, pretty graphically illustrated here, uh, aerospace is now dominated by three massive, three mega U.S. businesses. The, and this is commercial and defense combined. The Boeing turnover is nearly five times that of the largest European aerospace companies, uh, British Aerospace and Aerospatiale, and Lockheed's some three times higher than uh, the major European aerospace uh, suppliers. Now, some four and a half years ago, uh, I was privileged to be invited to stand here and deliver the Brabazon Lecture on uh, the future of uh, commercial aerospace in the world. And in that uh, lecture, I used uh, simple mathematics to demonstrate what I felt uh, was going to happen. And what I basically did was use the sales forecasts of unit types that were unanimously agreed in Europe and on the uh, other side of the Atlantic for each class of aircraft. And when you totaled them up, it was some 18,000 commercial aircraft were going to be sold over the next 20 years, which sounded a massive total. But I then broke those down into actual aircraft sectors, and the simple arithmetic I applied was to divide the predicted annual sales, which as I say, all companies had bought into and accepted, 
by the number of aircraft airframes pursuing those sales uh, and also uh, assuming a minimum production rate that any company could uh, achieve and remain profitable and viable. And that um, very simple arith arithmetic uh, produced the findings in, in that lecture. Uh, the first, which was pretty obvious, that of the uh, three producers of large aircraft, uh, one could not possibly survive. The market was only big enough for two. And uh, it didn't need too much clairvoyance to see uh, which one would not be the survivor. And uh, indeed, uh, Boeing and McDonnell Douglas are, number, uh, are one company. Secondly, I looked further down into the smaller aircraft category, into the regional aircraft, and showed that in the 100-seat jet market, in fact, the annual sales were barely sufficient for one type one company, uh, let alone two, and I made the very simple prediction uh, then four and a half years ago that either Fokker or Avro had to go. I wasn't uh, brave enough to uh, forecast which one, uh, and as uh, fate has had it, uh, it was Fokker. And thirdly, I looked further down the scale at the large turboprop side, and uh, again, by uh, simple mathematics, predicted that uh, of the five main producers of turboprops of 50 seat and above, uh, no less than three had to go. Uh, otherwise, no one could make money. And indeed, British Aerospace, uh, Fokker, and more recently Saab have all taken the decision to vacate the turboprop market. With this uh, major shakeout and the moves that uh, are clearly in train for Airbus industry, to uh, become uh, a PLC uh, as soon as possible. I think that uh, one can predict that the future in commercial aircraft is now uh, pretty stable. Uh, Boeing and Airbus will continue to compete uh, and will be the only competitors. And once the 3XX is launched, which I see as inevitable as night follows day, but the sooner the better, uh, there is no reason why that market should not be uh, very evenly shared. Uh, moving down, uh, there is just a uh, 100 seater. Uh, of course, uh, at least one more uh, will be launched, but the market is certainly not big enough for anyone, anyone after that. And all I would say to those uh, in the market uh, below that, in, in the uh, turbo prop category, that uh, I've noticed, and I dare say others have, that the jet age has arrived. And uh, that will, uh, in fact, uh, be uh, throughout, uh, and in my, in my uh, view, uh, the whole of the market. It's not the best time in the world I would have thought to be launching new turboprop aircraft. So that's the civil side. For the rest of this evening, if I may, I will therefore concentrate solely on defense, because this is where the changes will take place and are required. And all through history, the, the 94 years that I've shown, uh, the changes have indeed been driven by defense, uh, largely not the commercial business. So looking at the similar picture for defense, there you see it. And uh, the names have changed a bit in terms of order, but the, um, the solution um, or, or uh, the picture is actually the same. You can see that Lockheed Martin is nearly three times larger than the largest European defense company, British Aerospace. The uh, UK, France, and Germany do incidentally, between them, comprise 91% uh, of the European defense industry, and therefore are the, the major players. So let's now look, if those are the sizes of the businesses, let's look at the respective procurement budgets which actually drive the success of those companies. Again, you see the massive dominance of procurement, defense procurement in the United States. Indeed, the average annual US procurement is more than four times larger than either the UK or France, the two European leaders. And even if you took all of the European procurement budgets and lumped those together, 
you see it would still be in Europe only half the, uh, the procurement budget of the United States. The situation in defense is therefore very clearly that uh, we have in Europe too many aerospace companies and businesses chasing too small a market. Exactly the same situation that I sought to uh, outline in uh, my Brabazon lecture of four and a half years ago. Perhaps this is shown even more graphically by this picture here. On the left you see that there are just 14 major defense companies, and this is covering all of defense now, not just aerospace, land systems and sea systems, chasing a budget that averages around $60 billion per year. On the right, there are no less than 43 companies, and the right number of arrows is there, I promise you, so you needn't count them. Major European defense companies, three times more than the United States, chasing defense procurement budgets only fractionally over half the size. Another way of looking at this is that, on average, a United States defense company can expect nearly six times the sales and therefore six times the production throughput uh, with all the associated savings and economies of scale. And this, perhaps more than any other picture, is the one that uh, has led to the three governments at least taking uh, a governmental position on what needs to be done about this, uh, this situation uh, and asking for those plans for March the 31st. And I'm delighted that uh, Dick Evans uh, is here tonight because I think that, uh, in my view, in the last year or two or three, there has been no stronger voice in Europe uh, than Dick's for uh, the vision of what needs to be done. And I'm thrilled that he will now be and continue to be right at the center of this key planning phase uh, over the next few months. So what is the, the way ahead? Well, let's just for, for a moment smoke a little opium and think the, the unthinkable and see what it would look like if uh, Dick Evans and George Simpson uh, suddenly decided to, uh, to get together and uh, British Aerospace and uh, GEC uh, were to merge. I'm only smoking opium for a second, I assure you. Uh, and suddenly, uh, the United Kingdom would become a major player on the world defense scene in terms of balance sheet strength. And uh, this would certainly uh, provide some uh, beneficial rationalization in, in a small number of fields. Uh, in the uh, field of uh, radar systems with uh, British Aerospace's uh, pending acquisition of Siemens Plessy uh, and GEC's Marconi radar. In uh, command and control systems where both British Aerospace and GEC have uh, command and, com and control capability. And of course it would provide huge economies of scale in management, in infrastructure, uh, in marketing, uh, and so on. But uh, it would, however, be largely a, a vertical integration, and vertical integrations do not shake out surplus capacity. Uh, across uh, the, the majority of those two companies, there is not uh, huge duplication in product lines. And the real problem in Europe is one of surplus capacity and duplication. Whilst vertical integration in itself uh, is clearly uh, not wrong and has advantages, what is really required in Europe is horizontal integration, uh, horizontal integration that shakes out the excess surplus capacity of uh, internal European competition. And horizontal integration is, of course, the most powerful catalyst for eliminating those uh, surplus capacities uh, that do exist. So if some horizontal integration took place in Europe and just five companies, British Aerospace, GEC in the UK, Aerospatial and Dassault 
in uh, France and DASA in Germany combined into one major European company, then Europe would clearly have uh, a defense industry which could compete on equal terms with, uh, with anyone in the world. And there you see the picture. Now, if you uh, go a little bit further and add into that, uh, or if you did add into that core five companies and add Saab uh, in Sweden the, uh, with the Gripen, uh, Alenia in Italy, Casa in Spain, uh, Thompson uh, in France, uh, then Europe would be right up there uh, with, the, with the biggest, with Lockheed Martin in defense. So that is just dreaming and smoking opium for a minute. Let's now briefly turn our attention to the, the highly important missile business. Again, as you can see, there is uh, a similar story. In this case, Raytheon is more than three times larger than the largest European company, Matra BAE Dynamics. And if Europe was able to combine the three companies that you see there, Matra BAE, uh, Aerospatial Missiles, and GEC, into one single major European missile business, then the picture would look like this. Europe would be in a position in the vital and growing missile uh, business of the world to compete on equal terms with at least two uh, of the major US players, if not with Raytheon. So if this is the broad picture in terms of numbers uh, of what, what we are facing. What really are the issues and the drivers that uh, are there for European consolidation? Well, firstly, I, I hope I've shown in what I've said to date that um, peacetime budgets, and particularly peacetime defense budgets, uh, with the end of the Cold War, thank goodness, can no longer support the current number of players. That clearly is a fact. Secondly, that uh, with the ever more rapidly increasing technology developments that uh, we now see, development costs will inevitably continue to rise. They're not going to come down however much we would like them to. And the derivative of that is, of course, that only the largest companies uh, will be equipped to prime major programs in the future. Uh, smaller companies acting as primes and systems integrators is a thing of history. With the need for ever greater industrial efficiencies and their effect upon the all-important overhead ratio of companies, uh, this will become ever more critical as competition grows. It's interesting that Lockheed Martin have estimated that by the end of the decade, the economies of scale that have derived from uh, that merger will save no less than $2.6 billion in, uh, uh, in cost, in their cost base. Another interesting and uh, rather worrying statistic is that U.S. companies now have inventories which are half the scale of the average European companies. Uh, the asset base of US companies taken across those that uh, I have shown is just 54 cents per dollar of sales, whereas the equivalent figure, average figure across the European companies of asset base is 96 cents uh, per dollar of sales in, in Europe. Last but uh, no means least amongst the drivers for consolidation is the importance of industrial strength upon market share. The market of influence of companies out there is clearly uh, proportional uh, to their market share. But I'm absolutely convinced from my experience over the last uh, 25, 30 years out there in the market that uh, market influence is not directly proportional to market share. Uh, I believe that market influence is proportional to the square of market share. If a business can double its market share, it will quadruple its market influence on the future. 
and therefore market share is a vital factor and the size of uh, a business drives uh, the market share. In a recent presentation that I saw by John Weston of British Aerospace, uh, he showed this picture, which uh, I totally agreed with and have therefore rapidly plagiarized. And uh, what he really said is that only four defense sectors can continue to support profitably more than two players. And on the left, you see the one-player sectors, military aircraft, helicopters, missiles, uh, radars for combat aircraft. The market simply is not large enough to support more than one European player and make money, uh, which is, of course, the objective and what uh, the businesses are there to supply to their shareholders. Uh, military engines, only room for one player. So why is it that... Uh, European consolidation has been so slow and uh, the United States consolidation has taken place at such uh, breakneck speed. Well, I would like to suggest a number of factors that uh, have been at play. It's certainly not that Europe is not good at collaboration. Europe actually leads the world in its collaborative skills. Uh, just look at um, Concord. Uh, a remarkable triumph for collaboration between France and uh, United Ki Kingdom in terms of technology. And I believe that uh, the Concorde uh, really paved the way in teaching us how uh, collaboration should work. And I'm delighted that uh, my old boss, Jean Pierson, is uh, here tonight, surely one of the great figures in the whole of this century of aerospace development. And uh, Jean, uh, very nice to see you uh, again here. Not only have we collaborated on Concord, look at all the other successful European collaborative programs. I've touched on Airbus, uh, a remarkable success story to show that uh, the British, the French, the Germans and the Spanish can work together so successfully, not only technologically, but uh, in terms of commercial results. Jaguar, an Anglo-French collaborative program, Tornado, highly successful program, Britain, Germany, uh, and Italy. The Lynx, the world's most successful naval uh, helicopter, uh, an Anglo-French program. Eurofighter, the fighter of the future, Britain, Germany, Italy, Spain. Uh, onto the missile side, uh, the Anglo-French Storm Shadow, Matra BAE Dynamics, and so on. So we're actually remarkably good at collaboration. Uh, it's, it's not that. It's... Firstly, that uh, you cannot really mix the uh, public and the private sectors. It's like seeking to mix oil and water. The, um, the pressures are totally different. In the private sector, of course, the pressures are for efficiency, for productivity, uh, for, productivity uh, for profitability, uh, for rationalization, for shaking out excesses for uh, lean uh, companies. Uh, for public public-owned companies, the pressures are totally different. The pressures are uh, political, the pressures are uh, job preservation, and so on. Uh, they, they are in conflict. This is one of the reasons uh, we are not yet a totally privatized defense industry in Europe, uh, and that has affected progress. Secondly, there have been national restrictions uh, upon foreign ownership in defense. Uh, in this country, uh, Dick Evans and Ralph Robbins have been uh, publicly stating the importance of uh, removing these uh, ownership restrictions, and similar restrictions apply uh, elsewhere in Europe. Thirdly, there is and has been the inevitable desire for national leadership of defense uh, programs. This uh, desire for leadership has remained intensely strong and intensely uh, competitive. Uh, national security is often quoted as the reason. I don't actually believe it. I believe the uh, real reason is uh, the status, the, the chauvinism uh, of having leadership. The US, of course, has not had a uh, national status problem, a leadership problem in their rationalization. Fourthly, there is a um, 
difference of view as to whether I industrial restructuring should be led by government policy or by commercial considerations. I think that uh, up to now, uh, Britain and France have represented uh, the different ends of the, the spectrum. Uh, in the UK, there has been a very hands-off approach to uh, future policy. In fact, uh, in previous government, the policy has been not to have a policy. And uh, in France, the approach has been extremely hands-on with the government uh, really playing a huge role in dictating uh, the way ahead. I happen to believe that the optimum is somewhere halfway in between these two models. I believe government has to take uh, a lead and has to support strongly, but also that industry has to be allowed to make the commercial decisions that only they can. And I believe that the important statement of this week uh, is an excellent step in this direction of government uh, beginning to show leadership uh, and agreement. So what is the way ahead if that is the situation that uh, we face? Clearly, uh, the privatization program uh, has to be completed. And uh, we here look across the channel uh, with hope and anticipation in that direction. Uh, the alternative, of course, would be in this European collaboration for uh, uh, an Anglo-German axis to uh, form the basis and I think that would uh, not be the, the right way for us to kick off. Secondly, on the way ahead, uh, we have got to remove all cross-border restrictions on shareholding and ownership, and I believe that the statement of this week is a very clear hint that governments are now prepared to move in that direction. Thirdly, the shareholding uh, should be driven by industrial and commercial considerations, uh, not political considerations, not uh, national status, uh, not chauvinism, not national leadership. We should let uh, market forces apply in the ownership of the companies. Fourthly, uh, ever since time, time began, uh, rationalization discussions between um, industrial leaders have often and frequently founded on the, uh, the debate, the very important debate, as to who gets uh, which job uh, around the, the board table, and of course, in particular, uh, who leads. Um, without that uh, preoccupation of nationality on the actual personnel leadership of these companies, the US have managed these issues uh, extremely successfully and elegantly, although these issues have still be been there in the United States when major companies come together, who, who should be the president, who should be the CEO, uh, who doesn't get uh, a seat, uh, they are there, but the United States has managed to uh, finesse its way through it, and Europe must as well. Uh, there is no substitute, in my view, for having the best man for the job, uh, regardless of uh, nationality. If, the consider if, if this consolidation uh, I've been talking about is to be successful, clearly procurement is a key issue. And procurement is the one major tool that uh, government does hold. And uh, the larger the procurement contracts are, uh, the greater will be the, um, uh, the throughput, obviously, of any industry. Large companies cannot survive on comparatively small orders and small production runs, and uh, these are the derivative of the fragmented procurement approach that we currently have in, uh, in Europe. And let's not underestimate uh, the difficulties. Uh, OCAR, the new armament agency, will seek to, uh, of course, to bring together best practices of procurement in UK, France, and Germany and Italy, but best practices alone do not represent uh, rationalization of uh, operational requirements. And rather than individual nations fighting for leadership in technology in every sector, what we have to achieve is a European agreement on 
centers of excellence and the distribution of centers of excellence. No longer can we afford the duplication of those centers uh, of excellence. And finally, I think it's absolutely vital that any collaborative pro programs should be product-led uh, and not led by idealism. Success in the past has only been achieved when businesses come together to prosecute clearly identity, identified objectives and clearly identified portfolios of products. I think the most classic example of this is Airbus industry. Uh, if Airbus had come together as a conglomerate to think about what it should do, uh, there would be no Airbus now. What Airbus industry and the three nations, or the four nations, came together to do was to design, develop, build and sell a specific product, the A300, and a derivative family from that. It is, in fact, the only way to go. Now, is all this, uh, are all these challenges that uh, I've articulated just simply too difficult to overcome? And should we instead bin all this, and should the recommendation on the uh, 31st of March to governments be that it's too difficult, and what we ought to do is concentrate on building the transatlantic relationships that uh, we already have, and uh, seek to put uh, Europe and the US together instead of Europe together first. Well, I believe there are a number of fundamental uh, problems which prevent this, this approach. The first problem is, in fact, the very size of the United States market compared with the size of all the fragmented uh, European markets. And the size of this US market inevitably dictates that those major US defense companies who I've shown and whom we all know uh, will have leadership and will continue to have leadership of their national defense programs. Therefore, with a transatlantic attempted collaboration, uh, Europe would inevitably lose its capability to prime major programs, would lose its systems integration capability uh, on major programs. Now, the United States is certainly pursuing a global strategy. The United States is not being parochial or insular. Uh, Outstanding examples of that are such companies as uh, IBM and Microsoft. And of course, uh, Boeing itself is pursuing uh, an extremely uh, successful uh, globalization program through its supply chain. And uh, Boeing aircraft have uh, major components built in Japan, Italy, uh, and, and increasingly in the future, uh, the United Kingdom. But the United States globalization is through, in fact, captive subcontractors and the, uh, the supply chain. Secondly, uh, the United States is, of course, the world's only remaining superpower. And with this comes the resultant independence uh, of foreign policy, which will be, and is important, of course, is maintained. The US would therefore find it politically totally unacceptable to, re to rely upon foreign leadership of any of its national uh, defense equipment programs. Thirdly, the size of the US home market and the industrial strength of the resultant companies mean that collaboration, international collaboration, is not a prerequisite for access and market share in the international market as it is for each of the individual European uh, programs. Now, I hasten to add that this is not to say that uh, I in any way am proposing a fortress Europe, or for that matter, a fortress United States. I believe that transatlantic cooperation and transatlantic partnership are absolutely vital ingredients for the development of industries in Europe, and I believe industries in the United States. And we already have a number of extremely successful Anglo-US collaborative programs. I've mentioned Airbus. Interestingly, on average, Airbus aircraft across the range are 30% uh, US content. Uh, therefore, Airbus is not a, a, a European collaborative program. It is a transatlantic 
uh, collaborative program. There are other highly successful examples. The, the Harrier, one of my 16 most influential aircraft uh, of the century, uh, became in collaboration with McDonnell Douglas, uh, as it was at St. Louis, the AV-8A, and now the highly successful AV-8B. The um, Hawk uh, of British Aerospace is also the uh, T-45 of the then McDonnell Douglas, now Boeing, the uh, United States Navy trainer, and a highly successful program that is. And of course, let us not forget Rolls-Royce. The, um, uh, the procurement and merger with Allison, a major, highly successful uh, transatlantic collaborative program. Looking into the future, there is the Nimrod 2000, the British Aerospace Boeing collaborative program, uh, which will be uh, highly successful and, of course, influential over the next uh, quarter century. And looking even further into the future, the JSF program, a vital international transatlantic collaborative program uh, featuring not just British Aerospace and Rolls-Royce in this country, but a host of vital systems uh, suppliers. The large, I think the truth is that the larger and stronger the European industry uh, becomes, the more capable uh, of transatlantic collaboration we become in Europe, and indeed the more attractive uh, European industry becomes to the United States uh, mega companies. Uh, and therefore, these will become partnerships and collaborations more of equals than of unequals. And uh, partnerships and even marriages of unequals never tend to be a long-term success. I believe actually the future will not be one of Europe versus the United States. It will be Europe and the United States together serving the world market and indeed competing over the next 30 and 50 years with the rapidly developing tiger economies of the Asia Pacific and uh, not least with China. And as the only true transatlantic collaborator at the moment, the United Kingdom, I think that we in this country are in a crucial and absolutely unique position to lead this uh, transatlantic uh, collaboration. The United Kingdom can be the gateway for US industry into Europe, into uh, continental Europe, and also the United Kingdom can be the gateway for continental Europe into the US, where uh, continental European countries uh, are not currently penetrating. We therefore have this vital responsibility and role of becoming the two-way gateway of the future. Now finally, uh, briefly, I'd like to look at the thing that drives all of the future development of the programs that uh, these industries will be facing, which is the R&D budgets. It is an extremely serious issue. Today's programs that we've been talking about do actually, of course, result from research and development, research and technology which took place 20 years ago, not what happened last year and the year before. And here you see the massive differential between the United States R&D budgets, annual budgets, and those of individual European companies, uh, countries, I beg your pardon, which you can just see down along the, uh, the axis. Even if you combine all the European R&D budgets together, uh, you still see that the United States is spending more than three times that of combined Europe on research and development. And worse still, much of this European research and development money is wasted by duplication and triplication of effort. It is crazy that Europe should be developing two air superiority fighters, Eurofighter and Rafale. It can make no sense. It is crazy that uh, Europe should be developing three main battle tanks, the uh, Challenger in the United Kingdom, the Leopard in Germany, the Leclerc in France. The United States, with a far greater market, has just one main battle tank uh, manufacturer, Abrams. And so uh, the list goes on. Now, the advantages of a European approach to R&D is that if we did eliminate this duplication 
uh, and triplication, we would, of course, by def definition, free up the resources uh, available to individual products. We would have pooled, uh, rather than fragmented, specialist expertise. We, uh, we would have all our experts working together on common programs instead of in duplication and in opposition uh, on competing programs. We could gain much synergy from combining the knowledge and the capability of our respective research centers instead of, again, having them uh, waste money by duplicating their efforts uh, carrying out similar levels of research. And finally, the result would inevitably be more capable and more competitive equipment for our own armed forces and uh, for our export customers. What um, this really comes back to is, I think, a requirement for a rationalized European uh, defense procurement uh, system, which is therefore driving the research that uh, these various institutions are engaged upon. Where is seeking to harmonize R&D uh, between nations, but has to uh, accelerate uh, that program. In looking at the problems of this approach, secondly, uh, we do need nations, as I've said, to relinquish this obsession with technology leadership right across the, the field and agree to establish areas of uh, center specialization, centers of technology, centers of excellence. The result will be no individual European company will anymore have total capability uh, across the field. We would become highly interdependent, uh, which would take a major cultural shift after hundreds of years of uh, defense autonomy and defense conflict. Thirdly, this does of course imply a considerable degree of shared uh, security and that leads on to common foreign policy. Now finally, in the two or three minutes left to me, I'm sure you would not expect me uh, to conclude any lecture without a mention of the export market and the effects upon the export market. Here in the export market, you can see the dominance of the US with uh, United Kingdom, these figures for, were from 1992 to 1996, the last uh, five-year period. The United Kingdom lying second, and in uh, 1996, I'm pleased to say that the uh, United Kingdom achieved some $8.3 billion worth of export orders, which represented 25% of the total world market. Not bad for a little island with less than 1% of the population of the globe and a defense industry a quarter of the size of that of the uh, United States. The statistic I like uh, even more is defense exper exports uh, per capita of uh, employees in the defense industry in uh, the United Kingdom are three times higher than uh, exports per capita in the United States and five times higher than exports per capita in France. If, however, we did uh, consolidate uh, defense industry, uh, there would be a much greater balance in defense uh, export market uh, share around the world. And therefore, if you accept my thesis that uh, market influence is the square of market share, uh, a much greater balance of market influence. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that the Announcement this week by uh, the governments of uh, Britain, uh, of France, and of Germany are certainly a very important step in the right direction, but only a first and faltering step in the right direction. Uh, not yet the equivalent of the famous uh, William Perry Last Supper, but maybe perhaps uh, an invitation to attend the Last Supper and uh, perhaps a taste of uh, what might be on the menu for the hors d'oeuvre, if not the main course. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>